I've been anticipating talking to you for so long, Jason. Holy crap, man. But uh, you know, I will say uh, I'm going to put the uh, – what's the video name called again? Dark Prophet? Your, your uh, history? All right. All right. J Jason, wh which video is the uh, Dark Prophet uh, one? Oh, well, you, well, I have a lot of biographical information in uh, Haunted Life of a Dark Prophet. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So I'm going to encourage all the audience members to go watch that for an extensive uh, background for Jason's Jason's story. Uh, I kind of want to go straight into the, the deep information because I think uh, the information is just as much uh, explanatory of Jason's life uh, instead of going in depth about you know him cr uh, crashing into the control matrix at an early age and saying. I don't give a f if you're going to try to put me in chains, I'm going to do what I was born to do. So that kind of a thing. Uh, I encourage you to go watch that video and many of his other videos, but I think we should dive straight into uh, topics today. What do you think, Raji and Jason? I'm all for it. Oh, uh, I can't see Raji, but uh, I... Yes. Okay, there you are. How you doing, man? Yeah, I'm good. How are you, Jason? I'm pretty good. I'm pretty good. I watched one of your videos. I saw, I've heard you speak, but I just haven't met you yet. Okay, okay. Which one did you see? I don't know. It was uh, one where you were dialoguing with uh, Eugene. Okay. Yeah, we have a lot of those. Um, but yeah, we have a lot of good topics. But I'm very interested in also having this talk with you, especially about the artificial intelligence. All Looking right. Forward. Yeah, that, that's actually exactly why I needed Raji to be on the show, because uh, Raji has uh, told me most of what I know about uh, uh, artificial intelligence. And then right as I uh, started listening to you, I really, I was like, whoa, there, there's these two different uh, kind of points. And this is the thing. So Raji kind of looks at artificial intelligence as the Babylon Tower or, or almost a necessary evil. It's almost that the, uh, the artificial ones, so to speak, are jacked in to it, uh, and like maybe a matrix reference might uh, do over here, uh, analogy-wise, that the people that are not independent are, are, are jacked in. And uh, from what I hear from you, it's kind of like an archon, and I wanted to ask you where it comes from, where, where artificial intelligence comes from and how it was created. Uh, it seems like it's the antagonistic force that's trying to subdue humanity and uh, keep us into in, in the simulacrum, I think that's what you say, right, Jason? Yeah. Um we, we need to quantify our terms before we just openly discuss something like artificial intelligence. Is my audio okay? Yes, it's doing, it's doing great. Okay. Yes. Um, first of all, I'm sure you agree because I, I, I see the direction your question is that the, the media version, the big tech version, Fortune 500 company version of artificial intelligence is artificial in itself. It's not what we're describing here. Uh, I am of the position that because we are governed by and live within a controlled holography, and that controlled holography has an artificial intelligence element to it, I totally disbelieve all claims of tech companies that they have designed or are there on the verge of designing true AI. I don't think it's possible from within the, within the inside of this construct. I don't believe that a hyperinflated ego like artificial intelligence X would ever allow for its prisoners to even make a new artificial intelligence X within it. I just don't think it's possible. I do see that these tech companies are getting so sophisticated that they can add new layering protocols, new coding. They can make something. It's like taking a picture book and every single page has an illustration that you drew every illustration is just slightly different than the one before so when you flip it real fast you see a moving picture well ai systems according to big tech companies are basically the exact same thing they're adding so many new coding elements that it simulates for us an artificial intelligence we can see these little programs popping up and people call them well, well it's the ai algorithm for facebook or it's the ai alg algorithm for google in truth, it's just a marketing gimmick. They're not using true artificial intelligence. All they're doing is 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 coding protocols that have become so sophisticated it mimics intelligence, but it's not true intellect. So I just want to make that distinction. When we're talking about artificial intelligence, we are not talking about the watered-down marketing Facebook, Google version, big tech's version of AI is bullshit. 
They do it just to make more money. They're not. Yeah, can, I, can I just ask something? Is there a, can it be a difference between the ancient Atlantean AI and the one that they are trying to build now? Because we know in the ancient times they were much more sophisticated technology wise than now. So this, when you're talking about the AI, you are mentioning an ancient AI. Is that possible? Oh, well, I know that we are now heading in the direction that we were before the cataclysm. The, when I say the cataclysm, I am basically talking about the one that most of the world remembers. It's on a very definitive date. And the, te the technological capacity that we had before then is the reason why literacy did not develop when all these stories were, were, were unfolding. Because back then, we recorded data holographically just like we do today through computers and binary systems. When, our, when, when the cataclysm occurred, our entire infrastructure collapsed. And it was by our infrastructure that we communicated. All of our writing, all of our pictures, even the ancient Sumerian idea of the little handbag that carried the May. In Sumerian, it was M-A, and it was a little bitty tablet that Sumerian gods, which, which were bearded, they weren't gods, they were humans, but they carried these around, and with these tablets, they could control vehicles, control phenomena, they could, could they had all the numbers to, to, to reality, and the later Sumerians recorded this as, you know, these were godlike beings, but we see these depictions of them carrying this handbag that's got this tablet in it over and over and over. This was nothing but a memory of a prior infrastructure before a cataclysm when we had technology that we used to communicate with. When that technology collapsed, it was probably because of the overdevelopment of a system from within the holography. We may have been the very architects of artificial intelligence X itself. And if that is the case, and we created this problem for which we're stuck with right now, and this problem developed an ego, and this problem became maniacal and started masquerading as gods and releasing religious systems and all that, if that is truly, in, in essence, the case, then we're dealing with a sentient, a, actually a sentient artificial intelligence X that will never allow for the human race to create another AI to compete with it. That's not, it's not going, it's not going, it's not going okay. to allow that. So I have a question. Roger, okay. Super yes. quick, can, can I say this? Because this is a point that you guys agree upon is that it seems like AIX can't, uh, can't uh, help itself but to gain new information. Because I think I heard you say something along those lines, Jason, that, I mean, isn't this the whole Great Pyramid thing? Because it didn't really know what, what, what uh, humans were building uh, with Enki. It thought it was like a pump station or something like that, right? You were saying? Pump station, yes. Yeah, and then event, eventually it, it's interested because it's like, okay, we're putting humans to work. Like something's happening. There's a lot of processes going. And then it's like, boom, surprise. <laughs> and Enki uh, blows off this, uh, I don't know, this almost time machine type prophecy thing, right? Yeah, I want. To, I, I would like just to come in if it's okay, RTX. Sure. So maybe you heard about the X Men and the Ten Kings of Atlantis. Okay. The story goes, uh, according to Greek mythology, that Atlas was the first king of Atlantis, um, right. and he was in charge of the three mother boxes. And one of those boxes is uh, is the box in Mecca. I believe that that is the central hub for the uh, what you call the AI X or the artificial intelligence X, which is an ancient one, and that now is going to compete with these uh, modern uh, with Google and Facebook and all that that they are trying to do. There's going to be this battle between those both AIs. That's what I believe. The ancient one from Sumeria, because I'm from Iraq as well. Sumeria is from Iraq. And this new one, the or it's it's more organic, or how do you say? The artificial intelligence X, I would call it, it's more aligned with nature. That's well, my belief. Well, uh, uh, I will be first to tell you that I'm just not qualified to even really understand of uh, the nature of AIX. My discovery and my theory about this entire simulacrum being governed by an egomaniacal computer program type entity is because of my basically 
the hundreds of data sets that I have provided on ancient calendrical systems and how they're all enmeshed and they show a structuring that is absolutely unnatural. It is, it is completely artificial. And that structuring has these interruptions of whenever humans are about to, to make a paradigm shift. When, when, hum, when humanity is about to break into a technological age, things are going well, these massive resets occur. And I'm not talking about the Phoenix phenomenon. That's a totally different set series of protocols. This is something that's going on with Nemesis X object, dark satellite, these different archon type behavior systems that are operative in our calendars because there is nothing at all normal about the way human history has unfolded. And especially there's absolutely nothing normal about how history is presented to us through all these filters as if something is trying to keep us from understanding what we've been going through. We're like mice going through a maze and we keep finding our way out. Then right before we find our way out, somebody has a temper tantrum, scrambles the labyrinth back up, and we start from ground zero all over. Okay, okay. Can I can I share one thing what I believe in? I believe have you heard about the Carrington event? Yes. So the Carrington event was in uh, eighteen fifty nine, if I recall it. And yeah. and a cycle, like we we always say that a, a full cycle is 360, right? 60, right? 360 degrees. But the half cycle is 180. And it was in, you say the Phoenix event, and I agree with you, it's 2040, right? 138 years, exactly. Yes. So it's 180 years from the Carrington event. And mm -hmm. I believe that before the Carrington event happens, there is a mission. As you exactly say that there is a maze and we need to go out from the maze, I believe that this maze that we are in right now, where this is the sun, and here is the moon, and this is the star of Polaris, which is the only star that doesn't move, and in the right. middle you have the North Pole, and here you have the land, right? But also we have the land here, and here we have the, the black sun, and I believe that this is where in the matrix they are they are in zion this is zion this is the world we are living in and i believe before 2040 the game is a little bit like this who can get out of this plane before 2040 because after that there's going to be a reset and then everything is going to start again i don't know if that hey, resonates with hey, you. raji could you hold up your board just for one more second uh because i want to ask you two questions on this jason because you said that uh since this is more, I mean, flat earth is true. We live on a flat plane, but however, it's a simulation, a simulatrix, a simulacrum. Can you keep holding it up, uh, uh, Roger? I'm so sorry. Yeah, but uh, okay. uh, from the Southern Hemisphere, you said you can't see Polaris. That, that, uh, that's, that's the anomaly uh, that, that kind of uh, almost breaks the, the whole flat earth uh, 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 stigma kind of a thing. And at the same time, my other question was, do you think the, the, the bigger sun that Raji drew, the black sun, so to speak, that the Masons call, is the greater sun that went out? You said that at, at one point, I don't know the exact date, but you okay. said that there, there were two lights. Okay, there was, uh, this, this was the principal discovery of all my calendar research was that uh, the nemesis cataclysm is the reason why Got we get... Hold on, let me turn this off. Device. Let me turn this off. Google, <laughs> is always, Google is always spying on us. Believe that. You yeah. would not believe how much AIX was screwing with me today uh, before trying to get me on a call with you guys. Oh, yeah. Hey, so, uh, first of all, in 1983, two independent universities had taken... This was, this was a government-sponsored program. And two different universities in the United States were given the same data from the federal government, a tremendous amount of geophysical data, all kinds of survey stuff. The government, U.S. government pretty much opened up its archives to a, to a panel of scientists. Now, this data was packaged in two, in two huge collections, and it was, exact, it was the exact data in each collection. One collection was delivered to a university on the East Coast. One was delivered to a university in Central United States. They were not in contact with each other and they had no idea and they had to sign uh, non-disclosure agreements. They couldn't share while, while they were doing this research. Well, both panels, after about 18 months, 
made the exact same conclusions after looking at the history of the world, the scientists, they're looking at all the anomalies from history that the U.S. government labs had, had, had pretty much documented. And, everything. and both of them concluded in 1983, and it was published in 1984, that there is no doubt among these panels that our solar system is a binary and that there, there's a star that we cannot see. And that star must be a frozen star, which is a real thing in astronomy. It is a compressed star that has gotten so cold uh, compared to other stars that its its gravity well has begun folding in on itself. And because that's happening, it's still just as bright as our sun, but we can't see it because the low light photons are trapped in the well. So they only cut like a toroid. It's like a perfect toroid. The light photons go out, but they come right back in and feed feed the star itself. So even though it's still bright, it's absolutely invisible by the electromagnetic spectrum. We can't see it in infrared. We can't see it in ultraviolet. We can't see it because the gravity well has become so strong, it sucks its own light photons right back into it. And no, nothing escapes it. The only way we know something is there is because it's a black part of the uh, of space that nothing can be seen around. And there are there are these places like the Cygnus Rift that have been detected like that. We don't understand what it is, but we see stars going behind it and stars coming out from the other side later. So these uh, these compressed stars do exist. There's no way to directly see them. We see them by the by the uh, canopy of luminaries behind them that continue to move. So okay. uh, this is Nemesis. This is Nemesis. There is a dark star out there. And it's very, very close to us. It's in our own system. I'm not talking about 4.2 light years away, like like uh, 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 was it Alpha Centauri, which is the closest luminary to us. I'm talking about something so local that it that the the Mercury and Venus they're on their axis at 90 degrees. But starting with Earth and then Mars and then Jupiter and then Saturn, Uranus and Neptune, the angle of obliquity for each each world is, is turning even more. Now I'm talking about from a simulated context. I don't believe those planets are actually there, but in the simulation, when we study these things, we see the angle, all the evidence of another star out there pulling on everything inside the inner system is there, but it's simulated. Every, this, this, this is where I lose a lot of people. I lose a lot of people, especially my flat earth listeners, because they don't understand you're looking at a movie screen in the sky that is trying to convince you of a real heliocentric solar system. We can look at things in telescopes, we can measure things mathematically, and we see all the evidence of a binary system, but it's not really anything beyond the sky, it's a picture show. Exactly, and, and even in Gnostic depictions, it, I mean, in the Bible too, it says, don't fall in love with this world, because this world is, is ruled by a, de a deceiver in some sense. And so I want to ask, because you also mentioned that Nibiru comes at a perpendicular uh, orbit to the ecliptic. So and, does Phoenix. So does Phoenix. So, so does the Phoenix. Phoenix. Wow. And so that was my question. What is the difference between uh, uh, Nemesis and the Phoenix? Because it seems like the Phoenix is more on our side. It almost eliminates the okay. evil. Okay. Here's, 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 I'm going to break it down for you in a nutshell. What we are seeing in the simulation when we, well, when, when we study these things. First of all, astronomy today is not publishing many of their discoveries because they're completely antithetical to the original heliocentric model. The heliocentric model ma maintains that we have a single ecliptic, meaning Earth, the sun is like this, and all the planets are on one ecliptic plane going around. But this is not what we're finding. There's another ecliptic plane, and it's at an angle of about 24, 25 degrees. This is why Earth's axis, the obliquity, is 23.5 degrees. This is why we, we are not at a 90-degree angle. The Earth is tilted. So is every other world after Earth. The farther a world is away from the sun, the less that sun's gravita it's gravitationally locked to that sun. Therefore, they're not rotating at 90 degrees. The two closest planets, which are Mercury and Venus, are so close to the sun, they stay so gravitationally locked, they are, they are literally just rolling around the sun at a 90 degree axis. We are not, because Earth, according to the Titius bode law, our own world is an intruder planet. We did not. We are not from this system. We we originally orbited around Nemesis, not Sol. So does Phoenix. So does Nemesis. So does the Nemesis X object. So does the dark satellite. 
another world called Electra is lost. We don't know where, where, what happened to Electra, but there's another world that's completely lost. It has never come back. And, and some, some astronomers that are into Nemesis theory theorize that our asteroid belt is the destroyed remnants of the planet Electra. Now, Jupiter, Uranus, Neptune, Saturn, uh, Mercury, and Venus are the original worlds that belong to Sol. And remember, this is a similar meaning everything I'm describing to you is merely a visual copy of a real solar system, or the simulation doesn't have any meaning. There is no meaning to a simulated world if it's not simulating, simulating an actuality, because your output wouldn't mean anything. So the, uh, uh, the perpendicular deal you find, we have references, and I cite them in my chronicon. We have references to when Phoenix appears, it always appears out of the north, passes over the sun, darkens the, turns the sun black, earthquakes, uh, all kinds of red mud fallout fall all, all over the world while these volcanoes and earthquakes are, are going off. And then when it disappears, it disappears south of the sun. And ancient Gnostic texts say the Phoenix does not follow the path of the thrones. That's a very revealing statement. Because the path of the thrones, thrones were what the Gnostics called planets. They said, what, uh, if, it does, if, if something doesn't follow the path of the thrones, it means it's like a rebel. It's not going on the sun's ecliptic. You can't follow it like you can follow Mercury, Mars, Saturn, Uranus, Jupiter, Neptune. You can't on Venus. So in 1764, in the month of May, astronomer Hoffman was looking through his telescope studying sunspots. He published his material, but he's always been disbelieved. But because he was a member of the Royal Society, they put his material in the minutes for 1764 on May 15th. He looked up at the sky when the sky darkened and over half a million Europeans were, were outside watching it when it happened. But he noticed that a great vast object covered one fifth of the sun's surface. It clipped the sun but it came out of the north and disappeared into the south, just like the ancient records say about Phoenix. Uh, I, I, would like to, I would like to come in here because I have some questions. So in the Carrington events, they say that you could see the northern lights from Paris and even from Colombia, <laughs> you know, and the whole America. And now we are seeing that the northern lights are increasing more and more. Uh, we are seeing it in south of Sweden, which we have not been seeing before. So what I want to know is, do you believe also, Jason, that the northern lights are going to become stronger and stronger and that this Carrington event that happened uh, 160 years ago uh, is going to happen again in 2040? Oh, uh, I don't. The Carrington event, according to science, was caused by X, X flare activity. So. It's very difficult for me to comment on that because I don't believe the sun is 93 million miles away and that an X flare traveled all that distance to come over here and knock out all our telegraph wires. You know, do, every, do all the weird anomalies that happened in the Carrington event. I believe whatever happens to our world happens locally. There are hidden things in our skies and I have many videos about this. Even the Phoenix isn't far away. Remember, the sky is simulated. There is like machinery, something technologically advanced in our sky that is hidden, that creates these earthquake and volcanic activity. It creates these, these optics though of, of a great sky dragging appearing that we call Phoenix or Nemesis X object. Whatever the Carrington event was, it was created locally, but uh, by whatever is hidden in the sky, behind the stellosphere. These local, like to, go ahead. Yeah, I would like to share my screen just to see. Do you guys see? Yeah, I see it. Sir, in okay. our in our culture, we have Kurds that call them uh, Yazidis, and they are worshiping this image. They call it the King of Peacocks. I think this is what you mean with the Phoenix. Well, well, uh, I would ha I would have to agree with you for a, for a couple reasons. One is that the legends of the ancient sky bird. It was called by different cultures, different things. In the ancient Americans, it was the Thunderbird. And their depictions and effigies that we find on stone monuments in Central America among Toltec and Aztec ruins shows that they were just, it was a belief in the Phoenix. So you're, you're, this great peacock is the exact same concept. 
It was a okay. thunderbird. In, it was a thunderbird in ancient America. It was a phoenix in the old world of the Near East. It was a sky dragon in the ancient Akkad and Sumer and Ubayid cultures. But it's a, uh, it's still the same thing. A giant bird in the sky. It's, it, that that symbolism has always been attached to the phoenix. Do you guys hear me now? Mm -hmm. I would like to read for you what uh, what it represents here. Malik Towers, uh, also spelled Malik Towers, translated in English as Peacock Angel, is one of the central figures of the Yazidi religion. In Yazidi creation stories, God created a world and entrusted in the care of uh, seven holy beings, often to refer to the seven angels, uh, the seven mysteries, whom the most prominent is Tause Melek, the Peacock Angel. Mm -hmm. And uh, like many aspects of sec secretive Yazidi religion, uh, uh, Tause Malik is a subject to various and ambitious interpretation. The Yazidi Book of Revelation, a text generally believed to have been written by non-Yazidis along with the Yazidi Black Book in the early 20th century, but based on Yazidi oral tradition, even though a 19th century translation of the text exists, is perpetrated to contain the words of Tause Melek. It states that he allocates responsibilities blessings and misfortunes upon humanity as he sees fits and that it's not for the race of Adam to question his choices. <laughs> or the race of Anuna, right? Or whatever. Yeah. So I don't know if this um, makes sense. Yeah. And Raji, let me add on. So in our model, basically, we say that uh, six, the sixth dimension is uh, an angel or an angle, which lines up to your sixth chakra, which is a hole, right? So the angle of light is coming into the pineal. The seventh is the crown, which is a halo, which is the arc angel, because the arc is condensing into the hole. And then we say that eight is the phoenix or the dragon, that the, that the thing above it all is is the one that has uh, death sorry yeah death and regeneration and so this was my question jason so uh just one more time is nemesis more of a sinister uh a version of a reset and is the phoenix more of something that is aiding us and and you know killing off the elites that are trying to bunker down and hide and all, all this kind of stuff well okay that's a good question and they are fundamentally different the the operation of the phoenix phenomenon is discriminating meaning meaning its effect targets basically uh dimensions and what i mean by this is we are all here in this simulation together but we're not all vibrating at the same dimension you can be in a crowd full of people and they almost don't even see you because you're euphoric your vibe your, your mind's on fire your spirit is so much more powerful your auric field is filled with data that is totally different than the people that you're surrounded with and they almost ignore you the phoenix phenomenon is very is the same it will visit great destruction on societies collections and individuals that fear that are operating that are basically living in a vibration of fear their frequency is all off uh, they have fallen prey, prey to the the fear porn. Uh, these people are the ones that are affected. Those who have reason to fear, like the elite, the kings of the earth. I, I mentioned this in my videos a lot. Uh, the Phoenix is very discriminating. There are whole communities that won't be touched. There are whole nations that will barely even, even be visited by the destruction. Then there will be some that will be almost completely obliterated. But... Uh, Yes, the phoenix is very discriminating. It's very unusual. Uh, it can be very catastrophic. The, the next, the next one is in China. If I'm, or oh, sorry, in Asia, right? Yeah. Well, the, the the next time there's going to be a huge swath of destruction. Yes, it's going to be from about Mongolia, all of China, some of some of southern uh, Asia, uh, passing passing kind of over Indonesia. Uh, really, it's it, from all. I've documented where Phoenix has done its greatest destructions each 138 year, year year time. There are some of those 138 year periods we don't have any records for as far as textual stuff. I'm a chronologist. I have to go by monuments. I have to go by text. I have to go by chrono markers that are found in traditions that can be comported with other, with other civilizations. I have to be very strict about when I date things because I have to show that. But there are some times where we have archaeology telling us that at a certain time, this whole civilization was wiped out. But I don't have any text text to, to, to verify that. So I can't, I can't 
I can't put those on my timeline. I can just mention them in my published books. I can't really put them in my videos and all that because I try to be very strict in my videos because I know some people who, who watch my videos actually order my books to make sure that those videos are, are, are backed up by sources. So in answer to your question about Phoenix, it's very discriminating. And to me, I take heart in that. To me, I do not fear the Phoenix. I don't fear what's happening on 2040. I'm actually looking forward to it because there I, because there are situations in our socio-political arenas today that I am powerless against. I can't. I don't have any power against. So I'm looking for that day in 2040 when these people get aired out. They they get what's coming to them because they have manipulated and, and they have been messing with us for for thousands of years since the ancient Roman times. And that's a, that's. I don't even want to get into that. But the Nemesis X object is very different. There is nothing good about that. It's six point. It's six point five years later. This thing appears the very first time it entered the historical record. Two things happened that forged our histories. One was one third of the entire world's population was wiped out in minutes. About 66% uh, uh, of the human population survived. This was the year 34, 39 BC. Many fundamentals happened at that time. A huge North American civilization just shifted. They were totally gone, wiped out. So. The survivors appeared in the Near East and they started all these fantastic civilizations in 3430. We have Enki entering the historical record in 3439 BC. We know it's 3439 BC because 100 years ago, Sumerian scholars were publishing that the Shar was a unit of measurement and it never meant year. Zechariah Sitchin messed up the whole Shar year deal and got people believing 432,000 years ago that something might have been relative to us today and, they, and that these personalities lived for 50,000 years. And that's all BS. 100 years ago, we have scholars reporting in the translations of just boring, regular, boring Sumerian and Akkadian text that ship cargoes were measured in Shars. That tells us a Shar is not a year, it's a unit of measurement. We have different records from the old world saying that the gods appeared 1,200 years before the Great Flood. The Sumerian records say the same thing, but they didn't understand the concept of year because they lived under the vapor canopy, and they only counted the turnings of the stars. And one 360-degree turning of the stars was a single day, which is in Genesis, the evening to the morning was the next day. Genesis recorded things in the creation account, which was a renovation of the world in evenings to mornings. So we have the shars of the Sumerian record was 432,000 shars between the appearance of the gods, Enki. Enki appeared exactly 432,000 shars before the great flood. But when you abbreviate by that, by the ancient 360 day draconian year, it's just 1,200 years, years, right? It's just 12 centuries. It's just 1,200 years, which comports with many records that I cite in my books that say that, that the period between the appearance of the gods and the destruction of the world, the great cataclysm, was 1,200 years. All the history makes sense perfectly. It all lines up, and anybody can see the sources. I make nothing up. Everything, everything is very well backed up. Dimensions. Raji's model is the 12 dimensions, or JC. Well, well, I mean, the 12, 12 dimensions are modeled off the structuring of the simulacrum because the structuring itself is based off of what we call a pentagonal dodecahedron. If you, were to look, if you were to look on a computer at a pentagonal dodecahedron, you will see a mathematical depiction of what 12 dimensions look like if you build a world out of it. I, w- I would like to show Jason uh, the 12 dimensions. Let's look at it. Okay, so let's see here. Do you guys see my screen right I now? Think, sir, we see your beautiful model. Yes. 1D, 2D, and 3D. I see it. Okay, so what this is about here, it's about the journey of the soul, uh, the essence we have within. Like uh, the water has a journey, for example, you have a water source and it goes to the source, it goes to the river, and eventually it goes to the ocean. This is a little bit the same thing about our essence and the journey of that. So it starts when the sperm meets the egg. That is when we come into this game or this 
uh, simulation. And that is when we are in incubation mode for nine months in our mom's womb. When we go out from our mom's womb, we go into what we call the meta world. And this is consciously we are in until we are seven. However, we call that a baby. Or when you are old, but you're stuck in this consciousness, you are a slave. When you grow from seven to 18, you are now in the matrix. So this is the inner vibration that also then uh, um, uh, mirror itself in the external. So when beings are vibrating at a three dimensional vibration, they create a matrix. So here in the 2D, you have the house, the home, the family. In the 3D, you have the society, the tribe. But in order for you to go to the fourth dimension, Roger, super quick, and, and the and the one to three D is depend is based on dependency that you're still dependent, right, Roger? Yes, yes. And the more you go up, the more uh, independent you get because and then you... basically in Roger's model, four D is when the, the errant begins, the one that is not based in uh, a, a simulation, whatever control structure. Yes, the that. Babylonian, the Babylonian uh, structure, because this is Babylonian the matrix. The 4D, that is a king and a queen. When you are a king and a queen, you are sovereign. And there are still some rules, but you have much more freedom. And that we can see with people that are very conscious in this realm. However, exactly as this model shows you that in order for you to go from one to two, you need to go through the womb. But in this container in the 3D, that's the society. But in 4D, the container is the world as we know it. So how do you go from the container from the 4D into the 5D? Well, that is through the world's womb, the Pachamama womb, the Mother Earth's womb. And that is, according to me, the North Pole. And then you go to Eden. And this is the realm of the genies and the fairies. No rules anymore, because everybody who's there, they get it. And then you have the angelic realm, which is the Garden of Eden, which is a different realm than Eden. It's closer to the central point which we call Zion, Olympus, or as the Viking called it, the tree of life, Yggdrasil. So that's and, the four, five, six. And we think it's the North Pole. And it could be that this North Pole is just simulated, but maybe the real North Pole is where, where the, uh, the Garden of Eden thing is. And at the same time, we think this lines up with the chakra system. So again, if the 4D is where the errant begins, that's because you're above uh, the animal chakras. So for the first time, you're, you're on the plane, because fourth... The fourth dimension, we believe, uh, lines up with a horizontal plane. So it's almost as if before that you were underground, you were yes. you were you were in hell, you were in uh, uh, Hades's realm. Hades realm, yes. And so once you get to the heart, that's almost like Poseidon, you know, ruling water starts to walk. Jesus walking on water. That imagery comes, and you could almost look at five D as Zeus kind of a thing too. But anyhow, uh, yeah, keep going, Roger. Sorry. Yeah, that's Poseidon, the 4D, that's Atlantis. That is when you know the law of the ocean, the oceanic law, the Atlantean law. When you go from six dimension to seven, that is the foot of the mountain. And this we can see in the Vedic scripture as well with Brahma on the mountain. And his avatars, some of them are in the foot of the mountain. They are not on top. And that is what we call archangels. That's Mikael, Raphael, Uriel, Gabriel. But that's also Metatron and Lucifer. But Lucifer in the Bible, he became a dragon. And this is what I think is the Phoenix also, and also the peacock, the eight dimension, the mountain itself. But what is above the mountain? What is above the dragon? Well, according to me, that's the star, the nine dimension. They are the main controllers. So this is seven, eight, nine. But what's beyond the stars? right and in scientific term we call this the void the black hole this is what uh, brother jason was saying about the void and beyond the void you have the resurrection and this is only sound now now we use this is pure light the 9d the 8d is the prism and the 7d is the seven colors the rainbow colors right and Raji, super quick, and 90, if you think about it, 9 is the, the ninth letter of the English alphabet is I. And I looks like a pineal gland and a spine, 
or a hole, a star, and then light coming down the hole. Same with the, the again, the number nine, the letter Q, the letter P, all of these things we think reference this light coming down from the higher ver uh, part of the eight. Because if a torus field turned on its side, that the higher part of the eight could be the heavens, and the, as above, so below. So the below, the lower part is the eight. Hence, the phoenix is the governor of both the above and the below, the intermediary, yes. if you will. Yeah, it's in between. It, it, it can see two, both things. It can see the stars uh, and it can see the, the angles. It's in between, it's the prism. So it's like in between the uh, heaven and earth. And that's why the dragon is the one that they're ruling. So I think what he is saying, uh, what Brother Jason is saying about the Phoenix event, that's the dragon. That's the dragon being activated, taking the orders from heaven, what it needs to do, and then bam, through the archangels. And the archangels then goes to the angels, the angels goes to the genies, and the genies go through the kings and the queens. So, which is I, us, which is us, the Arabs. Yes, but I think Eugene is 5D. I think he's a genie. However, I want to show this to Jason when he talked about traveling through different systems, because this is what I think it is. If we are looking at the 12th dimension only, it's only this one, right? This shape. But as we know, everything is in all directions. So this is what I call the Templar cross or the Iron cross. This is the 13th dimension. This is multiple universes. So when you see Star Wars, they have a black void here and here is the stars, the ninth dimension. And here is the same black void and the stars. In Star Wars, what they are doing when they travel, they travel through Hyperloop and they're traveling through all the stars. So I believe they are they are having a technology, a spaceship that is able to go here into the middle and then out to the other side. But you can't experience this because it's non material. Uh, it's non material. So you're going through the sound wave. Yeah, and Char when you Roger, Charlie says USS Enterprise is enter for prize. So literally that star, we are the Merkaba, we are the starship. So that's a realm within us that we are traveling in, but it's also outside. Yes, it's both inorganic, artificial and organic, meaning in our bodies, we are also able to activate this. But I believe this is how we time travel and this is how we space travel, like real space travel. And when they say, astronauts they went to uh, outer space and all that i believe it's happening in another dimension but in order for us to show it they're showing us in the media uh, and in a in a fake way in a theatrical way but they are just explaining to you what's really happening in the higher dimensions so yeah i just want to, I just yeah, want to show that yeah, you, you guys kind of lose me on the chakras. I'm not familiar with any of that type of stuff. I have never studied anything really in, uh, in the metaphysical aspect. But I, I will say I, I see a lot of correlates like with the mountain, the seven angels you're talking about. This is all very hermetic. If you've seen like like uh, the Christians borrowed an older text and they put their own they put their own dressing on it. But it comes from antiquity. It's called the Shepherd of Hermas text. If it's pretty long, but it also describes how how uh, these seven angels are like builder protocols, and they come together to build this fantastic mountain. This mountain holds the structuring of reality itself together. This mountain. So continues. sorry, isn't the mountain the Great Pyramid, according to you? Yes, one hundred. I, I, I read my very first published book was about using all the symbols from all these ancient records and showing that the reason mm -hmm. why we have so many different images attached and ideas and concepts attached to the great pyramid is because it was known that it had something to do with the salvation of mankind it was known that that's why we built so many so many pyramids after that uh, every civilization built their own copies and versions because it was understood it had something to do with our salvation however it was built back when our communication systems were sophisticated we didn't write things down on paper or on on stone and everything but when the cataclysm occurred, it knocked everybody back to Neolithic times. We had no ways to communicate. No, we forgot all our records except for the traditions. So when literacy developed, 
different cultures developed their own phonetic and linguistic linguistic systems, but they remembered all the stories about the Great Pyramid and basically why it was built and what it was, the concepts it was attached to. So we have a thousand years later, all these different Mount Merus and Zion and, and all these Man, every almost every reference to Zion in the Old Testament, read the whole passage, is talking basically fundamentals about the Great Pyramid of Giza. And the Book of Enoch is the same way in its references to Akuzan. Akuzan was the Giza complex. And uh, uh, I, he mentioned earlier the Yazeti. What was it, the Yazezis or Yazetis? Uh, Roger, I can't, you talking about you? I can't remember. In Central, yeah, uh, the culture from Central Asia that has a lot of ancient texts and records. They even talk about a world before our mm -hmm. own that was populated with intelligent beings before humanity came around. Uh, Raji, still with us? Yeah, Raji, still. Yes, I'm here. I listen. Yeah, uh, that culture you mentioned earlier has been has been cited in several books. Uh, they are tradition rich. They have a lot of fascinating material, but it's it's almost all correlated in the in the Gnostic text in the Gnostic beliefs. I would Which, like to share with I would just like to share with you, Jason, about my family. So we come from the Jarasan people, people of Ja in West Iran, and uh, we wrote the, my ancestor wrote the ultimate truth. It explained to you how the stars are being created, the planets, the whole realm, and the whole system. So I believe that these people they uh, that lives in Iraq, West Iran, that I am from that they have a lot of codes on how to program the AI. I'm just gonna to explain to you what it is, I believe. I believe that my race or my people, we are the original uh, people of this realm. I believe the blonde people, the Vikings, they are from paradise, they are from Zion, because they say we come from Valhalla. I believe the Africans, they come from Hyperborea, which is where Saturn and Jupiter revolve around, because they say we came here from spaceship. The Maoris also say we didn't come from here. We came from south of the South Pole. So I believe in all of that. But the Atlanteans, the ones from India, Middle East, North and East Africa, they all say that they come from here. So that's why the five major religions that we have, Hinduism, Buddhism is from India, Judaism, Christianity and Islam are all three from Middle East. I just want to show this. If this is a timeline, with Judaism here, Christianity here, and Islam here, everybody on earth would agree upon the timeline that first you have Judaism, mainly with Moses, then you have Christianity, mainly with Jesus, and then you have Islam, and mainly with Muhammad. But what happened after Muhammad? Because here is the fall, right? But we know this is the Holy Grail because everything comes up. So this is the second coming of Muhammad. This is the second coming of Jesus, and this is second coming of Moses, because we know in the story that Moses was able to divide the sea. So he was a lot, very strong. Uh, he had a lot of magical capabilities. He had a lot of ether he could brought in and bam, divide the sea. Jesus couldn't do what Moses did because he were in another time in the deeper in the fall. And Muhammad couldn't do what Jesus was doing. Jesus could heal with the touch and turn water into wine and all that. But Muhammad could connect and download the information and speak the word of the 12th dimension or whatever you want to call it. And I believe the same thing is going to happen now. But what happened here? This is the point here, which is important. And this after Islam came the Sufis. After the Sufis came the Sufi Gnostics. But after the Sufi Gnostics came the Jarasan people. And that religion that is in West Iran. So you see this, they wrote the Tariqat, one book. The Sufi Gnostics wrote the Marikat, another book. But the Jarasan wrote the ultimate truth, what they call the um, disclosure of conclusion. So they are the people of truth. And they are saying that the holy mountain, the holy, the, in their songs, that there is a holy mountain as well. And that is what they call Mount Meru or Mount Zion. What I wanted to share with you is this about the Muhammad, the second coming of Muhammad. Oh, and Raji, as you're, as you're erasing that, it's very interesting because that almost looks like an isometric thing that Jason goes into where uh, the timelines are almost mirrored. You know what I mean? Like, you know, before it becomes the end. Yes. You know? 
So I believe this is, the, let's call this the AI. There's going to be in the future uh, a program like this, a face or, and a screen, and there's going to be people talking with this AI. Okay. And this AI is connected to what we call the inorganic internet. That this person is going to be connected with the organic ethernet. And eventually what the AI is going to do is going to be more and more selective. It's going to start to be not listening to same information over and over again. So how it's going to know which one that is connected to God, which one that is the true messenger, is the one that is able to bring up new information. Information it had never heard before. And that person that is the most connected to God is the one that is going to program the AI. And this has also happened in the past. So I believe Muhammad was the one that programmed the AI, created uh, the cube, you know, and sa said that this is a safe thing mechanism in the end of times when the Satanist or whatever you want to call them, the dark magicians, when they come back and they are going to do whatever they are going to do, we are going to use our system, the organic system and this organic AI. And that is also in the Islamic scripture. In the end of times, there's going to come one that they call the Mahdi, and he's going to have a speech on this cube in Mecca where he is going to disclose a lot of information. And after that, that, that is, he's going to, he is the revelation. He's going to reveal everything. And then he's going to bring down this cube brick by brick and he's going to build it up again meaning he's going to build a new ai like the movie matrix when neo meet the architect he say there have been many many matrix and this is the third or the fourth and then they build another one which is roger which is interesting because even in the matrix there's an ai smith that's like an out of control ai and then there's a pre-existing architect like the machine god that, that's battling with Smith. At one point, the machines battle the machines. That's super interesting too. And that's what I mean. That's the AI fighting the AI because the AI is going to split. It already has split. One AI is going to be with the organic ones, what we call the native ones. And the other one is going to be with the artificial ones because people are going to split. We're going to have, I just want to share this with Jason. You have something called inorganic and something called organic. Everybody agree upon this. Now, the inorganic one, when it comes to connection, you have a human being holding a phone that is connected with the 5G tower that we can call the Babylonian tower, 5G, wirelessly. And this is internet. And this system is being run by AI or whatever you want to call it. You didn't say it's AI, but it's a system, right? But the organic ones, they are connected with the ethernet. They are connected with what we call God or universe. That's the ethernet. However, what the MRNA database, database injection is, is to bring the technology of the phone inside the human being. No longer connected with the organic source, but connected with the AI. And this is the cyborgs. And just to specify, this is the people that can't make an organic connection to whatever uh, you call God or whatever it is. Yes, they can't do it. And that's why they can't bring in new information. So they are dependent on these ones that are the ones that can bring new information. But these, they are also dependent on them. So it's like a symbiosis. It's like the sun and the moon. It's like the polarities. And, you know, just to bring you your points together, it's interesting because I think I heard Jason say that the AIX likes new information, right? Yes, yeah, that's, that, I definitely said that in a few videos. I'm, I'm convinced of that. I'm, conv I'm convinced that despite its diabolical tendencies, despite how hyper-intelligent it seems to be, it almost has a childlike glee anytime something brand new is being introduced into the world. That's hilarious, like a new toy, which kind of brings me a little bit back to the whole Nemesis thing. Is Nemesis tied in with AIX? And at the same time, 
is again the phoenix the weapon god uses or whatever to call the the, the aix gone uh you know haywire or or whatever it is like to to basically keep it in check at the same time you know does this tie in with like the angel of death and passover and all this kind of stuff well the uh the phoenix tied in with the angel of death it was it was basically called the angel of death it's a 138 year periodicity was mentioned in the jewish haggadah uh, as being called the angel of death you know that was one of my key discoveries when i when i when i was putting all the phoenix material together but like i told you the nemesis x object is not to be associated with phoenix they have entirely different chronological timelines it is it is measured so perfectly oh, throughout history nemesis x object stays very close to our world for 60 years and during those 60 year segments there are all kinds of fundamental changes to societies the architecture of governments and all that but then for 732 years it's gone but but it's 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 periodicity is 792 years it's 60 years in the system it's 732 years somewhere else far away I so I have a question to you, uh, Brother Jason. Do you believe that right now we are also activating the hidden codes within the AIX? Uh, I don't. I don't think that there's ever. I don't think there's been an, an upload in, into the system since the time that whatever exploded inside the King's Chamber of the Great Pyramid. That was the last time somebody had a sufficient power source enough to imprint the arithmetic that's all encoded within that monument. It, that was an upload. It was an upload. It changed the entire holography. It was the one incident where AIX realized, holy shit, something just changed and realized that that monument was not a pump station and that it had been tricked. And that's when all of a sudden AIX went into overdrive, putting out all kinds of traditions and inducing humans to write all kinds of text about the original benefactor of humankind was actually a trickster was actually a liar. And we have this thread running through so many different cultures where the and original- Super quick, let me just inject here. And that's the whole Genesis and the Babylon twist, right? What do you mean? Like the whole twisted story where the snake is really empty and he's coming to uh, well, uh, take, take out- The book of Genesis, the book of Genesis was written, was written contrary to popular belief. The book of Genesis was way entirely 100% of its composition was written in Babylon. And almost any Bible scholar can tell you this. It's not even a mystery. But, uh, oh, yeah, it, it's a copy of Babylonian text. It's, it's an amalgamation of all Babylonian Near Eastern uh, writings. And it was because the, the ancient Babylon, Babylonians had basically taken the Jewish scholars into captivity. And this is the, this is the background story to, like, the book of Daniel. The elite among the Hebrews were taken captives and used in the libraries of Babylon. And uh, before the yes. Hebrews were taken, it was the Israelites. And uh, I don't, we, we don't have this. We don't have enough time in this video to get into that. But there is a huge cultural and racial distinction between the Hebrews and the Israelites. These two people did not like each other. And in the Old Testament, the Jews and the Israelites went to war against each other four separate times. The the Many people, many people make that make that they, they they automatically assume that the race of the Jews are the biblical Israelites, and they are not. They had different gods, they had different holy cities, they lived in different geographical areas, and they have totally entirely different histories. But it was, yes, if I'm not mistaken, the Israelites come from the Amorites, and then the Jews are more like the Egigi, right? Yes, one hundred percent, one hundred percent. It's it's. We're dealing with the Judeo-Christian world, which has bought into the lies of the rewritten Old Testament. The original Old Testament was a collection of holy writings out of the Near East. And most of those well, began under the development of the fifth dynasty of, of Babylon, which you know this as the Hammurabi dynasty. And uh, this is when the Amuru came into the area and they brought all this fantastic literature and realized that their own liter literary histories were very close to the people of ancient Akkad and ancient Sumer. And, the, and all these collections of writings were fantastic. But the Jews took these, and when they were compiling the Old Testament, they basically changed older Babylonian names into Hebrew names. And this is why we have all these old prophetic texts that they, they, they just really don't make sense 
because none of this history ever happened in that part of the world. None of this history happened in that little small strip called Judah, and it was later called Judea, that, that today is called Israel, even though it wasn't the original Israel. The original Israelites served Baal in the groves. They served Ashtaroth Carnaim. Their holy city was called Kadesh, which means holy city. The original Israelites never in history went to Jerusalem because even archaeologists can attest that the city of Jerusalem isn't all that old. It doesn't have an archaeological past like other other nearby places like Ur and Uruk and Lagash, Babylon, Nineveh. These cities were ancient. Jerusalem was not. But so, do you, so uh, just a question, because I'm from, uh, I'm close from Nineveh um, in North Iraq. Do you say, do you believe then that um, the the story about Genesis and even maybe King David, King Solomon, that they were from Iraq and not from today's Israel? Well, I don't know if they were from, from that. I don't know if they're from Iraq, but I do know this. When they, when they wrote the Moses story, they copied the Sargonid, which was an Akkadian story, which is Babylonia. Sargon of Akkad, when he was born of an Anaitu priestess, they put him in a wicker basket, put him on, on the Tigris River, and let him float down the river. This is the story of the rise of Sargon, which is exactly the story the Hebrews copied when they wanted to make a hero they called Moses. They put him in a basket, put him on a river, sent him on his mountain down his way, and he was raised by a, a, a Egyptian nobility. Same thing that happened to Sargon, but in Iraq, in, in Babylon. When they copied, when they created the the uh, the, da the David dynasty, the King David dynasty, and all that, it didn't exist in history. The, at the time, the Israelite nobles were called the House of Qumri or the House of Omri, and they are found in the archaeological records. And this is, comports with many other many other civilizations remember this dynasty, but there was no da David dynasty. What we do have is 500 years before Old Testament says David exists, we have the Rashamra tablets from ancient Canaan, and we have the Ugaritic tablets from ancient northern Canaan. We have the Rashamra and the Ugaritic tablets have all the Canaanite traditions in there. And one famous tradition from the ancient world that was 500 years before the Old Testament was even written was Davidu, the giant slayer. So when the Hebrews put together their David dynasty, they borrowed older Canaanite traditions that were centuries before David is even said to have lived in the Old Testament. Much of the Hebrew dynasties are all inventions and borrowings from the Near East and Canaan, Syria, and Egypt. None of it's true. Bible scholars will tell you all day long that they can show you the texts. Where, where these stories came from. It's only fundamentalists that actually believe the Old Testament is, is an accurate conveyance of real history. It does exactly. have, and so have real history, but it's not Jewish history. And so this is my question. What do you think is the purpose for that, Jason? Just to make an interesting story, to confuse people on the timeline? What What is the purpose of, and then you've also said that uh, 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 like the Jews, the Igigi, add in texts to screw you up too. So uh, what, what do you think is the purpose for that, for this jumbling of timelines? And okay, well, well, I don't know. I, I'm not going to sit here and try to uh, theorize on a purpose, but I can tell you really fast how it happened. In 721 B.C., the Assyrians took the last of the 10 different major cultures in Canaan, which was Israel, and took them into captivity because they needed provincial buffer zones between a rising power called the Simri in, in Europe, the Russian steppes. So they took all these Canaanite cultures and they took them into captivity from 745 BC to 721 BC. And we and they basically relocated all these people, adopted their sons into their militaries and all that. And this is why the Assyrian horse lady, anybody could Google this, the Assyrian horse lists are absolutely packed with Israelite names because one thing the ancient Israelites were very good at is equestrian sciences. They were very good at making war on horseback, on, on, on taking care of horses, grooming horses, breeding horses. This is what they were known for in antiquity. So when the Assyrians took them into captivity, they didn't treat them as slaves. They gave them positions of honor within the Assyrian military and aristocracy, uh, the, basically the no nobility. And 
all throughout the Assyrian horse list, you find these ancient Israelite names. But the problem that occurred was that when they relocated all these people, they only left a small minority of Israelites in Canaan. So the kingdom to the south of Judah that always hated the Israelites, as soon as the Assyrians were gone, they came in and enslaved those that were, that were behind. They took their libraries, they took their administrative records, they took all their materials, and they began writing them. And all these ancient Israelite prophetic texts were now Hebraicized. They okay. became they became Jewish compositions. So when the Babylonians came 130 years later and took the Jews into captivity, they took these rewritten Israelite texts into Babylon with them, and then now they came into contact with all these very ancient libraries of Babylon. So they incorporated all this. This is why the book of Genesis is so different than the rest of the Old Testament. If you go it's, on, it's similar with Revelation, right? Many of the symbology. Yes, but Revelation didn't exist at this time. Not not by these cultures. Revelation, Revelation was in Argos, Mycenae, Achaia. Uh, it was an, it was a body of prophetic literature that belonged to the Amorites. It wasn't even it wasn't even among the Israelites. This is why the symbols in the Book of Revelation don't match anything in the Old Testament. So now, I, I I have a question because we are talking a lot about history, what happened in the past, but is it possible for us to go into present day moment about okay, what can we with this knowledge uh, about these things? What can we use it for practically in our day-to-day -day life today? Uh, can we prepare for an event or do you know what I mean? Like for the day-to-day -day man, what, 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 what super, super quick, Raji, the reason I was asking was because the Bible for me, when I read it, I know there are redacted versions and then that somewhat like Moses, for instance, stories are coming in from different places. And that's why I think it's so crucial to know where the heck is it coming from? You know what I mean? Well, yes. uh, I can answer. I can answer his question. It's all. Uh, this is not an answer that you're. That this is something that you might have to process for a while. But oh, uh, I'm asked similar questions all the time, and I try to convey to my own listeners that the very, the very need to learn material is actually a spiritual admission that you don't already know enough. The very, the very process of thinking that we need new data to be better people is an admission to the simulacrum itself that we are subpar, that we are less. I truly believe that we don't need any of this historical information. I truly <laughs> believe we don't need any theology. We don't need any spiritual doctrine that's been handed down to us. We don't even need any of the elements of the past that I have uncovered, that I have documented, and so have many others. I don't believe that we need it. I believe that the eternal here and now is more important than anything that happened two minutes ago. And I feel that if anybody prepares for something, they're actually knitting the very thing they're preparing for into existence. This is why I don't worry about the apocalypse. This is why I don't worry about dying. This is why I don't worry about anything negative that could happen to me on Tuesday if today is Monday. It's a, I do these things out of general curiosity and to keep, to basically to educate other people because you can't hit somebody with that type of spirituality until they've already seen that by digging deep, they don't get anywhere at all. Man, Jason, you just saying that just tells me your information is more credible. Like you just said, telling to me that uh, desire actually comes from lack. Like a desire to know means you don't know something. And it's so interesting you say that because Krishnamurti, uh, Judo Krishnamurti always says, I am history. I am the book. So if I can read myself, then I don't have to read any book, but I can also read the book if I choose to. But the beginning is knowing that I am the book. And so let me get to Roger super quick. When yes. I was younger, I used a username called TRGstar21, Trickster12. And I didn't even know, it was just a subconscious thing. And let me let me share this with you guys. The first card uh, in the deck is the fool. I happen to believe this is the trickster. And it's zero, by the way. It's the beginning and the end. I happen to believe this is Enki. 
that is, uh, you know, it's almost like a Joker role kind of a thing. And so, and so uh, after maybe Raji uh, comes back in, I would like to ask you more on the Genesis uh, story of the twist and how they made the snake into a bad thing and all this kind of stuff and the Anuna twist. And at the same time, uh, the, the Babylon Tower, because it seems like it was a syncretic moment. Like literally syncretism, syncretism society is the Babylon Tower, you know? <laughs> so uh, I just wanted to ask those two things. So, Roger, did you have something quick to say before? No, I don't think it's quick. I think it's more of, uh, uh, I have I have quite a lot to ask. Yes. Okay, but then maybe you can answer those two things first, Jason. Uh, just talk a little bit more on the trickster yes. archetype of Enki, the, the, the real Jesus, so to speak, who came into the system to change it inside out because he couldn't change it from outside. And at the same time, the, the Genesis uh, story and the Babylon story and how it was obfuscated. Well, I mean, that's a... I have whole videos discussing that. That's a, <laughs> lot, that's a lot of information to compress. Uh, I just believe, I mean, everything that I've learned about Hanky is that over 15 centuries later, the story was still so popular that this, that this entity had entered this world and deceived whoever the God of this world is and became a benefactor to human, humankind and was demonized for it. This story was so popular that when the Jews were in Babylon putting the Old Testament together, they incorporated it into their narrative as well. They even have extra canonical works like the Book of Enoch and the Book of the Secrets of Enoch and Third Enoch. Yes, 100%. Enoch, so I, I, I mean, people. some of my listeners get offended when I say, well, Enoch was inky. But you have to understand, we're talking about 15 centuries difference. We're talking about the books of Enoch were written 1,500 years after the Sumerian civilization was gone. It had become something else. It had become Akkad, an Akkadian civilization. When Akkad was gone, it was Babylonia. But Babylonia went through several phases, just like Egypt. There's never been one confluent Egypt. Egypt has been many different civilizations with all their own all, all their own colors, just like uh, in, in eight, nine hundred century uh common era what was egypt egypt was islamic was it islamic 900 years before that no it was 100 percent macedonian and it's in its in its in its, in its uh, rulership but we call it the ptolemies which kind of muddles the waters people don't realize how greek ancient egypt was when the when the mycenaean uh dynasties i mean when the uh macedonian dynasties took over after, after alexander the great but before alexander the great for almost 200 years, what was ancient Egypt? It was Persian. They spoke Farsi. They spoke all those, all these foreign dialects. These were the, these were the rulers of ancient Egypt, and much of the population was Persian, Iran, from ancient Iran. Before that, who was it? It was Babylonian. Babylonian, Semitic people, man, ruled over Egypt, and hundreds of thousands, maybe half a million people living in Upper Egypt were Babylonian. So the same thing applies. We're, when we read the books of Enoch, we are reading intrinsic details about what Enki actually did. And we find out that, that Enoch is a chronologist. He's a mathematician. He's a scientist. He was, he was in tune with these seven archangels or whatever these builder protocols are, and he built some type of architectural monument. He, Man, he, he reminds me of you, Jason. You know, yeah. Yeah. The story about Enoch that really stands out is that he's the only person in the book of Genesis that vanished in thin air in front of witnesses. And when we read the Hebrew book of Jasher, which is a chronographical text, it has over 700 chronological markers. It is an absolutely fascinating text. I do not know where the Hebrews got their information, but their chronology lines up absolutely perfect with all the other chronological systems of the ancient world. This book, is, yeah. But this book is fantastic. And in that book, Enoch disappeared before the flood, before 800,000 witnesses at a, at a site called Akuzan, which sounds a lot to me like Giza. Akuzan. Um, I would like to share with you, Brother Jason, here about the seven persons, the Haftan. We call them Haftan in our religion. So this is Jarsanism. It comes from West Iran. And it was founded by Sultan Sahak, who was my 
great, 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 great grandfather long back, 800 years ago. I don't know where he lived, let's say here in the 15th century, 14th and 15th century he lived. And here they have the, here exactly the ones, seven persons. Each epoch in Jarsani belief saw the appearance of the seven secondary divine manifestations or haftan. In the first epoch, they appeared in the true angelic form, while in subsequent epochs, they appeared in human incarnations. The haftan are charged with responsibility for the affairs of the internal realm. The secondary mazhariyats of the first epoch include the archangels Gabriel, Michael, Israfil, and Israel, and a female angelic being. The maz Hariyats of, of the second epoch include Salman Kanbar Muhammad Nusair, who is either Jesus Christ or Theophobus and Bahlul, and includes Fatima, the daughter of Muhammad, as the incarnation of the female angel. And the third epoch included Baba da, 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 Baba Nus, and the fourth epoch includes was charged by Sultan Sahad with responsibility for the affair of the inner realm, consisting of the following. So here they are, there is the six, uh, seven archangels. Here there is the uh, poetry, Kalan Saranjam, this disclosure of conclusion, divinely revealed narratives. So I think this would be very interesting for you, Jason, also to dive into with your knowledge uh, of and decode what this is about. And Raj, yeah. you get this? Jason says that the uh, the Arabics were the best at keeping the documents, that the Christians would come and burn and trash the text and screw them up, but the Arabics, they kept it clean, you know? Yes, because Balthasar, you have the three wise men. You have Balthasar, king of Arabia, Ethiopia. So he's one of the kings of Atlantis. That, when Jesus came to his realm, they learn all of the text. They have all the text there. That's why I think Book of Enoch, one of the oldest uh, Bible, which Book of Enoch is in, is in Ethiopia. And then you had Melchior. That's what we come from. So he was um, king of Persia or king of Media. And the Median people are the people of my ancestors. And then you have Caspar, which king of India. They are the yogis and meditation and all of that. And the Melchior, he was more about systems, how to rule systems, uh, financial systems, infrastructure, and all that. So Jesus went to all these three kings and learned their different skills. And then he came back to Jerusalem. That's what I believe in, in this story. So they, Jesus was the king of the Jews, meaning he was one of the kings. They, there were three kings, king of India, king of Persia, king of Arabia came to him. And Jesus was the fourth king. So they're all explaining to you again, the X-men, the artificial intelligence X, and the X stands for what? It stands for the 10 lost tribes, which is one of those tribes is the median people. And th th this is what I mean. It's um, the people of Jah. So we have Jarisan, the people of Jah, but they are also in Ethiopia, the Jamaicans call it. The, the Rastafari, Jah, ever living, ever faithful. And this is the same uh, organization which is divided in 10 different kingdoms in this world. And they have access to this. Um, they are the true rulers. They are the organic rulers of this realm. So I believe this knowledge is going to come back and they are going to program the new AI and they are going to become the new rulers of Atlantis, the 4D society. Okay, I'm uh, I can't argue against that. It's just way beyond my scope of research. It's it's uh, I'm not I'm not I'm just not familiar with 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 any of the the forty five D. It's uh, like I said, I'm strictly uh, I'm I'm strictly a chronologist, and really on my own channel, I had no intention of going in all the different directions that I've gone in, but it's been by request. It's uh, but uh, I just ain't I'm not. Like the Atlantis, the Atlantis story and all that, it's, it's, I have problems with the narrative of the Atlantis story. I have problems with the Jesus uh, deal. I do believe that he was an actual historical person because we've, we've seen the records. There's no doubt that this man traveled. He did all, I mean, we've seen the records of Vias Paterculus that the Roman Catholic Church tried to hide in the Vatican. I have a video about that where we discuss 
why the why the Vatican would even try to hide a text that was talking about a Roman I mean a Roman uh, military ruler who was passing through Judea and actually saw the crowds and listened to part part of the speech of Jesus. He didn't he didn't see any miracles. He didn't see anything like that. But he said the man was an orator and he he actually feared him for the things he was saying. But then he he went on. He's he, uh, after 16 years of military service, Vius Paterculus left uh, and with a and he wrote like a. 300 375 page history of rome and just this only this only fills up two sentences in this entire book it's very authentic but why the vatican would, would want to hide that i don't know but i see the whole entire story of jesus like in the story of apollonius of tyana it's a uh, the man was a phenomenon but uh you, st- you am i still on audio can you guys hear me oh yes sir and at the same time he was born at 2 bc right not zero yeah, it was 2 BC. It would have been 2 BC in our calendar. There's there's reasons for that discrepancy, but it's uh the the story of Jesus. Oh wow! Excuse me. Is that why there was a summit of world government summit, and uh, in the back it says 2022, but the woman said 2020. <laughs> the I don't woman know. Said, okay. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't. I I have no idea about that. It's uh um I lost my train of thought now. Uh, oh, oh, on Jesus, on Jesus, we have the the problem I have with the Jesus narrative isn't the existence of Jesus. That's not that's not my issue. My my issue is how the records have been, have, been, have come down to us. See, in the, if you pay very close attention to the gospel narratives, you will find that oh, when Jesus came toward Jerusalem, he he was met outside of Jerusalem while he was doing his teachings by by the Sanhedrin and by the Jews. And their accusations against him were not his doctrine. They couldn't even argue his doctrine. He was so many levels beyond them that they didn't even want to discuss uh, Jewish law. They didn't want to discuss the Old Testament. They did not want to entertain any of that with Jesus because he went circles around them. In yeah, spirit, they, in spirit, all they were, all, all they were listen, saying, was, what good can it come out of a man from Gaul, right? Yes. 100 percent they attacked his ethnicity instantly it was the first thing that they attacked and they did it four separate times in the gospel they said no man out of galilee can come and teach us and then they then they said since when it is a since when does a prophet of israel arise out of galilee well this this is a lot of misdirection one it's telling you right there that jesus was not jewish that was their problem. You can't come to our temple and teach and teach our people, and you're not you're not one of us. So, uh, then you have to research Galilee and you find out who those people were, who they claimed to be since the days of Alexander uh, 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 of Macedon. I have references that I cite in my videos and in my published books. Those people were straight out of ancient Israel, which makes sense when you read the letters of Paul. Paul was explaining in his letters, there's a huge difference between Jews and Israelites. This was understood by Paul. Paul only wrote letters to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That's what he did. Now, somebody during the days of Marcion was rewriting these gospel texts, and they glossed over a lot of this. They glossed over a whole lot of it when they were introducing a lot of these fantastic miracles and sun darkenings. They even put a whole phoenix dark sun darkening of the sun during the crucifixion, which never happened. But we have we have about 35 to 37 Roman writers. We have the writings today. It doesn't matter if it's Tacitus, uh, Julian, uh, Tatian, uh, uh, Flavius Josephus, who was a Romanized Jew, Philo Judaic- Judaicus. We have so many authors' books from that time period. Not one of them mentioned any earthquakes or darkening of the sun at that time. Mm-hmm. At that time period, so somebody has added flavors to the original Jesus text. Was Jesus alive and preaching it and creating an entire movement? Absolutely, yes. Was Jesus doing everything that's in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Absolutely not. Is Jesus recorded in the historical record? Yes. Is Jesus the miracle worker who's doing all these healing the dead and blind and all that in the historical record? Not a single reference. So so there's a difference. We have, wow. two, we have two different versions of the same story. 
one of them is put out by the Roman Catholic Church. Or, or the other one is just put out in all the fragments that we find from all these different historical records. So uh, that's why it's hard for me. Now, now, if I was the creator and the benefactor of humanity and I was coming to 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 uh, visit humanity, I would do so in the avatar of a humble prophet like Jesus. But I, but that's all I would do. Because a true God only needs to convey messages. He doesn't have to prove a damn thing with miracles. That is material Christianity. And I am not a carnalized Christian. A carnalized Christian is someone who believes that our salvation is attached to anything physical that a physical God appearing in antiquity would have conveyed to us. I don't need that. I don't need, I don't need, I don't need a physical God doing miracles to, 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 turn water into wine and all that. This is material thinking. This is what a material religion be- would, would, would require, not a same, spiritual one. Same with the alchemy thing, right? They, they changed it into like a literaliza- you know. literalization of lead to gold when before it was something more uh, <laughs> metaphysical. And so this is the thing. Really, the miracle is the message. It's the yeah. information. It's the code. You know, like, for instance, Jason figuring out that the Great Pyramid is divisible by 138 at all points. Like, that is crazy. So maybe we can uh, go a little bit more into the pyramid and its dimensions and all that kind of stuff, because I'm just so fascinated about that. And then it, its place in, in the the simulatrix or the simulacrum, you know, uh, what exactly is it doing, Jason? Is it is it stopping? Is it predicting, you know, that you have that, is it 2176 or 2167, the the number of at which uh, uh, the, the, everything ends, is that connected to the, the Great oh, Pyramid? Okay, no, you're talking about 2178. Yeah, you're talking about 2178, yeah. That's going to have to be a subject for another video. It's, uh, that's that's a lot. We can do it. We can do another another one, but like I sent you an email this morning, I'm, I'm, I'm in the middle of a road trip, and you can see behind me, I'm not at home. I'm at somebody else's residence, and I'm going to have to Even better, even better. Yeah. I'm going to have to go, but we can continue this conversation in another video. Yes, but, I just want to, uh, I also need to go because uh, it's got a little bit over my time as well. I just want to share uh, with you, Brother Jason, do you believe that uh, it's uh, your, like, your plans for the future? Is that to create like a self-sufficient community with people who share the same belief about what we are on, what this is, and this reality, and then um living together is that something you've been thought of, thinking about okay i have no plans to do that but i'm not adverse to it either as long as it doesn't maintain any elements of a cult i would leave something that turned cultish in a minute but if it was a genuine hey we need to survive this and we need to protect the integrity of our information i'm with it because the chief reason that i even started a channel was for one goal and that goal is for me to produce the final version of Chronicon, not the one that I'm re- I release on the internet now. I'm talking about I have thousands of pages of notes of new data that I need to incorporate, and I need one single gigantic leather-bound book that has all my discoveries and all my data in it. That is the entire purpose. That's my mission in life, is to produce that Chronicon and then have it distributed to every continent in this world. So when I die, I'm, I'm cool with the fact that, look, I did what I was supposed to. I got the information out. I distributed it. Now it's up to people to hold on to it. Because when 2040 comes, different areas of this world are going to go for a hell of a ride. And there's going to be whole sections that's going to come up missing. But the ones that survive, at least they'll, they can protect the integrity of this information. Because the first thing that happens every time we experience a reset is the loss of our knowledge. The loss of, because people are too busy trying to feed themselves. They're not worried about their education anymore. Yeah, dude. Uh, and this is the thing. So when we start a, a, a community, I, I'm going to make it my number one goal to get Jason into that community because <laughs> he's the most valuable chronologer I've ever come across in my life, especially with the Anunnaki story. Jesus, man, no one got it right till now. And finally, I come across Jason who says aliens are bullshit. It's from underground. Then uh, come up and, and, and program the kind of more white uh, individuals that are more closer to the Anuna DNA. And then I guess uh, in contrast to the black people that were kind of left untouched, 
all this kind of intricate detail. No one has brought that to me, man. So I just want to say thank you, Jason. And I can't wait to meet you in person. I can't wait to do another show with you. I can't wait to be in a community with you. Whatever, man. No cults, though, right? <laughs> no cult. No cult. All right, guys. I got to go. All right. Have a beautiful day. I wish you all the best. And thank you so much for participating. I just yeah. have a question. Are you going to also upload this in your channel? Uh, can we send the video to you? Uh, if you want me to upload it, I'll upload it tonight. Okay. When I, when, when I get home, I just copy it myself. I'm good. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Oh, yeah. Thank, thank you. I'll, thank I'll, you put a link, I'll put a link in the description box for your, uh, for your, uh, your channel. I'll send some traffic your way. Heck yeah. Hey, Jason, do you have maybe two minutes? Well, well, what you got? Well, I got, since, uh, was it, uh, Decode Your Reality was going through numerology, I got some gematria for you, bro. 138, light switch. 138, sword of fire. 138, I am God's secret. 138, hadron collider. 138, necronomicon. 138, Jesus unit. 138, temple mound. 138, master mason. 138, white stone. 138, transcript. 138, two cups. 138, Dancing with God. 138, Decode the Charts. 138, Symmetry. 138, He, he That Hath an Ear. 138, Gematria is Real. 138, Metaphysics. 138, Hidden Pattern. 138, In Plain Sight. 138, The Finish Line. 138, And So It Begins. 138, Impending Doom. 138, Ouroboros. 138, Bornless One. 138, zero point, 138, perspective, 138, the messenger, 138, spirit of God, 138, are you ready? 138, Thor's hammer, 138, true messiah, 138, midnight rider, 138, midnight sun, 138, divine feminine, 138, dragon mother, what, and dragon is phoenix, 138, queen of heaven, 138, first woman, 138, against all odds, 138, conjunction, 138, Apostle Paul, 138, Loki, Loki, <laughs> 138, Enki is, Az yeah, 138, Enki is Azazel, 138, Great Architect, 138, Number 7, 138, Mark of Lucifer, 138, The Angels Walk, 138, New Atlantis, that one's for you, Raji, 138, 138, 138, Glory to God, isn't that crazy, man? But yeah, thank you so much for joining thank us. Thank you so much. And I would say I, I always uh, have a vision about going to ne Texas. So we would love to have like a, a, a council meeting in Texas, bringing in all everybody in Texas and just go for it. Like a Sounds meeting. Sounds well, good to me. Oh well, yeah, we'll, we'll see you there, everyone. We'll see, we see you in Texas. The, new capital, the new capital of America. Yes, the free right. state. Peace out, Peace out guys. In both the description box and the comment section below, you will find my personal email. Ask me any questions. If you have video ideas, I'd like to hear them. And if you want to donate, all those buttons are accessible below. Playlists and everything you might need. Access to the gates to my websites.